Welcome back everyone to the lecture about biomatch analysis. This time we will talk about biomatch analysis using Napari and Python. So I guess many of you have seen already Napari, the multidimensional image we are written in Python. It's kind of a missing piece for those people who like Python on the one side, but also would like to use interactive tools in order to process image data. So Napari is filling this gap. And when I saw it, when I was using it for the first time, when I recorded for the first time a video like this one, I was quite amazed how you can blend over in multiple layers of the information, for example, from your developing embryo here in this case, you can hide and show information, you can hide and show layers with different um, visualizations of different aspects of your data. And it is from that perspective, really a new thing, like in the open source community, a community driven project, which allows us to interact with image data in such an interactive way in three dimensions. So if you look at the Napar user interface, it commonly looks a bit like that. So dependent from what uh, plugin you have open, you find typically the view configuration on the top left side. Then there is this list of layers where you can also add more layers depending on what you are achieving. And these viewer controls on the bottom left changing, for example, allowing you to change from a 2D view to a 3D view or how you, how you look in your data in very general. On the right, you typically see these doc widgets. We call it like that, it's custom plugins, it's custom extensions of Napari with buttons and text fields allowing you to interact with your data in a specific way like a plugin developer was foreseeing. And you also find these so-called function widgets which typically have multiple pull downs where you choose a layer or an image where a certain function should be applied to here, for example, applying a Gaussian blur or uh, any other image processing filter. And when you look at this, in particular, this region, which is shown here on the left, depending on what kind of data you look at. So here on the left, we look at the gray value and an intensity image. And that's why we can, for example, change brightness contrast, or we can choose a lookup table, how this data is visualized. Here on the right side, we are interacting with a segmentation result. Technically, we call it a labels layer because we are looking at a label image. And there you have different tools available. So for example, you can draw in these labels layers, you can modify segmentation results, label images. And that's why these tools look differently depending on what kind of data you look at. We will also go into this a little bit more in, in, in a minute. Then there is in Napari a couple of core tools which are kind of relevant. Let me just play this video. So for example, here I opened an image and the image has three slices. It thinks, Napari thinks there are three slices, but I can split this stack into three individual layers. I will just go back to this point by clicking on this right click menu. And that's kind of important because it's from a user interface perspective, it's not super obvious that you have a right click menu here on this layers list. That's why I'm showing you that. And you can see here, you can duplicate layers. You can uh, change their type from label to images, for example, can make projections. And in this case, I loaded this data set, which I know has three channels, but Napari loaded it as three slices. So you can split this stack into three individual channels, and then you can modify how they are visualized independently. So that's like a common thing people need to do after opening their data, bringing it into a shape so that it is visualized properly, that Napari understands properly what kind of data is supposed to be. Also another thing in the same context, if you want to choose brightness, if you want to change brightness contrast, you see here you have this contrast slider and it's quite intuitive. You can configure minimum and maximum. Fortunately, histogram is not shown like an image J, but it's also here important. Also this slider has a right click menu where you can choose, where you can enter these um, minimum and maximum intensities, which are shown, um, this display range, we call it, you can enter it as numbers. So you can be very precise. For example, if you want to have two layers shown with exactly the same minimum and maximum, you can do it like that by right clicking here on this contrast limit slider. I'm also highlighting that because it's like not super obvious from a user perspective. I um, mean, I learned it quite late that this right click is there. That's why I'm highlighting this here right at the beginning. If you want to go in more advanced techniques, for example, for changing brightness and contrast, you potentially have to use Napari plugins. So for example, here you find Napari brightness contrast, and where you can see there is now a histogram visualizing a little bit the intensity distribution of these two channels. And you can, for example, use this tool to visualize the intensities between specific percentiles. So for example, I would like to see all the gray values, all the intensities in my image between the first and the 99th 
person type. So these kind of tools are not part of Napari Core, or not part of Napari Core yet. That's why there are plugins available for doing this kind of advanced techniques, for example, for brightness contrast visualization. A very common thing which people do in Napari is uh, annotating image data. So I show it here on the slide and then I will also show it live in action. So you see here um, a Napari viewer open with an image loaded. You can click here on this button which allows you to create a new empty labels layer on top. So you will now, it's that the visualization does not change because it's an empty labels layer, but you can in this layer, you can draw using this drawing tool. And you see here, I was filling out basically this region to annotate this one nucleus. Um, if you want to annotate multiple nuclei, for example, with different numbers, so this is like nucleus one, nucleus two, nucleus three, you have to use these plus and minus buttons here to draw with a different label on this labels layer. Again, I will show that in action in just a minute, but that's a very common task people do um, when they annotate images in Napari. So how do you start? You start Napari from the terminal typically um, by activating a conda environment first. Conda act in my case, the environment is called like that on your computer. It might be different depending on how you installed it. And then you enter Napari to start up Napari from the terminal. It's very common to start Napari like that. That's why I'm introducing it like this as well. Then Napari will open and you can, for example, open an example image from this menu. I will just, I will just load the blobs image as you have seen it on my slide before. And you see now here, um, you can configure brightness contrast as I was just showing it. And here the right click menu again, so that you can enter numbers. So for example, if you want to show the maximum intensity should be, the maximum shown intensity should be 200. You can enter this number here. I will just reset that. Furthermore, you can change the lookup tables. For example, you can, do something fancy like that. Um, and as you know, uh, changing the lookup table does not change the image, just the visualization is a little bit differently. I would just go back to the normal blobs dot image because I would like to show you how to draw annotations on that. So for example, um, you create a labels layer here with this button. And this is now this empty layer. I um, mean, you see the controls have changed. So I can click on the brush button and I can then start drawing. Um, you can, if you, for example, you want to do some deep learning training status, if you want to annotate individual objects and in instance segmentation or an instance annotation, uh, you can do it like this. And you see me, I click here this plus button when I go from object to object. And then it allows you to annotate these different objects with different intensities. And also see that when you watch here in the, in the bottom corner of Napari and I hover with my mouse over this object, you see also this is object number one, this is object number two, three and four. So these pixels in this region, in this label image have this intensity they were labeled with. Um, also quite helpful might be here this eraser tool. I typically recommend to change the radius as well so you can erase segmentations like that. Going back to the normal paintbrush tool, if you work with um, pixel classification, in particular classical machine learning, random forest classifiers, it's not recommended to annotate entire objects and fill them out. It is rather annotated to draw pretty thin lines. So for example, here I will now draw lines with a, with a radius, with a brush size of two. So before annotating again, um, I'm just going back to label intensity one, because I would like to draw the background, which is like the black region. I would like to annotate with label one and the foreground I would like to annotate with label two. That's a semantic segmentation and no longer an instance segmentation. I'm using the small radius here, uh, because for pixel classifiers, that's the recommended way of doing it. So I have the paintbrush tool activated and I can, for example, here draw a line around this object telling my computer that this is background, maybe another line here, also saying this is also background. And then I increase my label intensity and then also here I draw a line inside. I also tell the computer that the center is relevant, um, but I do not fill out this entire thing because the computer doesn't care. And then one tool for doing this um, is in the segmentation labeling menu, the object segmentation APOC. APOC stands for Accelerated Pixel and Object Classifier. It's a tool which is very similar to what you may know in ImageJ as VECA trainable segmentation. Elastic is using a very similar technique. So it's like a pixel classifier, a random forest pixel classifier for segmenting objects.
I'm selecting the image I would like to process, and I'm also selecting the ground truth annotation. And here it asks me to enter a number. The objects in the image should be labeled with intensity two. And again, if I hover with my mouse here over this region, it has this intensity two. So these pixels here are classified as object and will then be segmented as that. If I click here, for example, on train, I get my image segmentation out. So that's quite convenient. Um, I think also the segmentation already looks reasonably good. So I will now not fine tune this label image, even though I could and then train again. But I will hide my annotation to be not confused. So I will only see this blobs original image and the result of the object segmenter. Before you go ahead and do the next thing, for example, applying another plugin like I will just do, I also recommend to close these windows here on the side whenever you can. If you have more than three of these open, it will become confusing. That's why when you are done with a step, consider closing these windows. Okay, the next thing I would like to show you works in a very similar way is um, classifying these objects according to their shape. So you see there are some roundish ones, uh, big ones and big ones and small ones, and there are also these eight-shaped objects. So maybe we can train a classifier which can differentiate those. Uh, therefore, we need another labels layer. This time I'm renaming this labels layer by double clicking on it and I give it a reasonable name so that I can later on the user interface identify this layer. If they are all called label one, label two, label three, it will become confusing. So I will call this one now object annotation. And I will again with the same brush tool, I will annotate the objects which are elongated like these three, four here. I will annotate them with this one layer. Note that I'm drawing now on this layer and not on the segmentation and also not on the other annotation. And then I will uh, create another label and I will say, okay, I will these roundish objects, I will put one of these blue dots on it. You could also draw a line, doesn't matter. The, the key point is that um, the intensity of this annotation layer should hit these objects in behind. In order to classify objects, you find this in the menu segmentation post processing, object classification, also APOC, accelerated pixel and object classifier. User interface looks very similar. It asks us for a single image and we only have this one choice. So that's not very complicated. The labels of the objects we would like to, to, would like to classify are the result of the object segmenter. So the segmentation result we have produced earlier. Then it also asks for an annotation, and that's the annotation I was just drawing, the object annotation. When you now go through these features, okay, we would like to differentiate these objects according to their shape, maybe also according to their size, because these objects are bigger than, for example, those. And I think the intensity is irrelevant. So you can click here on the train button, and you will then get a classification like that. We could also modify that and then get a better classification out just to show the principle I'm, I'm leaving it like that here. But creating new labels layers, annotating something, running a plugin, getting a new labels layer out and then hiding and showing these layers, that's very common task people do when they work with Napari. So it makes a lot of sense to get a bit used to what these buttons here do, how you can use these controls for drawing in a labels layer. Um, and that's very, again, a very common very common steps. Good. Let's have a quick look how Napari can be used from Python. So Napari, is, it's recommended by the developers to use Napari, for example, from Python code or for Jupyter Notebook. If you use a Jupyter Notebook like this on the left and Napari on the right, it's a very nice interactive tool where you, on the one hand, you can load data with Python code, opening the file from disk, putting it in the viewer, you can remove layers, you can show layers again with a different color map. For example, you see it here now in green. Um, it's very convenient to see what commands do with Napari or what commands do to your image data. And you can still in the Napari window interact with your data. So that's this nice win-win for both situations. On the one hand, you can code, you can do a segmentation here, threshold O2, connected component labeling and all these um, common algorithms and see everything in a three-dimensional interactive viewer. So that's very, very handy, let's say. How does that work? Um, in very simple um, terms, so in Python code, you import Napari, the Python library, and then you can afterwards create an empty Napari viewer like this. 
Uh, but when typing it is quite uh, a thing which sometimes goes wrong, that this here is an uppercase V, and also this variable is typically called like that with a lowercase V. So just it's it's not it's not like necessary, but people do it like that. Example code is often written like that. And then you can say viewer dot add image, and you can pass a numpy array, and it will then be visualized in an Apari viewer after executing this line of code. What's also quite useful, especially when you work with Jupyter Notebooks, you can call this line where you have to put your variable for the viewer here, and then a screenshot will be taken in Napari. So you can, for example, write a Jupyter Notebook where you load some data, then you ask the user, can you please annotate something? And when the user is done and continues executing the cells from the notebook, you can take a screenshot and document what the user has been annotating before the additional processing steps were executed. You can remove layers like this with a little for loop. You can, again, it's the same command as on the slide before, viewer.addImage, but you can also pass another parameter like color map green, which will then choose here in this pull down. Um, it will basically choose this particular lookup table depending on how the command was executed. You can also do it later. For example, if you say viewer.addImage and you collect the result of this operation in a variable, it's a layer variable. And also this layer has the property color map and contrast limit, so you can change the visualization afterwards. Uh, here the cool thing I really would like to highlight in this context, it's true in almost all of the cases that these commands in Python, like color map and contrast limits, these variables, have the same name like in the user interface. So you do not have to read the documentation. How do I change contrast limits? No, it's the same term as in the graphical user interface, and that's why it, it sticks quite easily. Furthermore, if you want to show segmentation results, so for example, here you see scikit image threshold O2 applied to an image and then afterwards added to Napari, it's important that here this function is no, not called add image, but add labels instead. So this creates a labels layer um, in your Napari viewer where an image is shown. Also here then the configuration of this labels layer and how it's visualized works similarly. So you can tune, for example, the opacity by passing the opacity as parameter. So it's quite um, consistent in this kind of context. Okay, so we have seen how basic Napari works, how we can call Napari from Python, at least for showing some images and segmentation results. Let's have a quick guided tour through the Napari plugin ecosystem. I cannot show all Napari plugins. I think we are now maybe almost at 400, but um, my colleagues and I, we programmed some and we are also using others from other people in routine and I can give you a little bit an insight of the plugins I'm aware of and the plugins we are using for processing images. One of the very first plugins, I think maybe even the first plugin, I'm not sure, is Napari Animation. It allows you to go through your three, four dimensional data set, look at it from different perspectives and set so-called keyframes. And from these keyframes, um, later a video will be generated. So you can then at some point click at save animation and then the animation is, for example, saved as MP4 file to disk and then the same a list of steps I was clicking before will then come as video, which you can put in your PowerPoint presentation. So in particular for three-dimensional exploration of data and visualizing it in presentations um, or a supplemental material to your publication, um, that's very straightforward. It's very easy to use. One of the most popular Napari plugins, I would claim. Then there's for exploring image data, also some tools. Uh, People also know, for example, from ImageJ plot profile, it's called there. Um, here we called it Napari plot profile, so that you can draw a line on a shapes layer this time, not on a labels layer, and plot the intensity along this line dependent on which channels, uh, on which layers are visual, shown at the moment. So that might also be useful in particular for having a look a little bit how channels are related and um, how intensities are distributed. And you find a couple of plugins um, for for opening image data. So we are more and more coming into an age where cloud-based storage plays an important role. So Napari or Mero from Teddy Lambert is a useful tool, for example, for opening image data, which is stored on an Omero server. So here you see me logging in to our Omero server, and then I can click, for example, on this sample folder, which was uploaded there. And then I can click on the names in the list to open these files, but I can also click uh, in this little list of thumbnail images and can have a look at this particular image data. That might be quite useful if your institute has an Omero server. Uh, sometimes institutes don't. <laughs> 
Uh, there's other uh, solutions for sharing data more general. I would not recommend it for image data, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, own cloud. There's also an Apari own cloud plugin where in a similar way you log into this remote server, you find then folders and you can open images and you can also upload the segmented image, for example, to the same own cloud server so that it's then afterwards available. So you see me now logging in and opening the segmentation again. So I think more and more of these cloud-based solutions for working with image data will come so that we do not have to store the data on external hard drives and walk around with it. Um, I think it's very generally better to have data hosted somewhere on a remote server where it's probably back up and then just with an Apari, just downloading this one data set you would like to work with and having a look at it. Also a tool I would like to highlight because from an interface point of view, that's a new thing I would argue. So you draw in a projection from one direction, you draw a line, then you tilt your view and you draw another line and this is mathematically enough to describe a line in three dimensions. So the Napari filament annotator allows you to do these kind of operations on your three dimensional filaments. It's a super cool tool, super nice from a user interface perspective. And I think it's a good example of what kind of tools many of us were waiting for for many years. And in ImageJ, these kind of operations were typically quite hard. So that's why gladly we have now this three dimensional image view on Napari. Then there's an Apari plugin, which has the name Apari segment blobs and things with membranes. Before um, I was working with colleagues um, and some of them were complaining that there are Apari plugins where the name isn't very explanatory and you do not know what they are doing. So I came up with Apari segment blobs and things with membranes, hoping that this is self-explanatory. So if you want to do this, Classical operations like filtering, thresholding, a seeded watershed. So what we this nice operations we know from ImageJ, which are sufficient for a vast majority of image data we are facing. Um, you can use this Napari plugin. It's based on Scikit Image and brings again this um, basic operations to Napari. There's of course also super advanced techniques like for example Napari Noise to Void here, written by Joran Duchamp, Tom Burke in uh, UCLab. And they maintain this Napari plugin around this very successful deep learning based denoising algorithm. Um, also the user interface is quite sophisticated. So you see here how the training is going. You can save this model and you can later use it either from Napari um, or from a Jupyter notebook or from other tools. Um, so that's very user friendly, very handy. Here I'm also just showing there's also segmentation algorithms, very popular in the scene, cell post, Stardust are also available as Napari plugins. So you can try out these tools. Typically, these two at least, typically, um, you do not do the training in Napari, you just can do the prediction in Napari. But I also would like to highlight M Panada Napari, EM like electron microscopy. So this is a tool um, also deep learning based uh, for segmenting objects in electron microscopy data. Yeah. So you see with a trained model, uh, it's actually quite easy to get these mitochondria here segmented. Uh, and uh, in particular in electron microscopy, this has been a challenge for many, many years. And Empanada Napari brings the solution right in your hand. Um, then here with Zach Marin and uh, Johannes Soldwedel, I was working on two plugins, Napari Pi Mesh Lab and Napari Process Points and Surfaces, um, working not with like a different kind of image data. Um, it's like going from the image data to some surface reconstruction and from the surface reconstruction also the post-processing algorithms. So this is based, um, so Napari Process Points and Surfaces is based on Marco Musi's Vedo library. Um, we did not develop these algorithms, right? So this, this for visual for visualizing the curvature on the surface. These algorithms are very uh, decades old potentially. Also smoothing of surfaces is like stuff which was there for many years. We just made it available so that the Napari people can use it. So if you want to, for example, measure shape in a very detailed way um, from three dimensional objects, this might be a tool to try out. And here you also find typical feature extraction tools. So this is Napari Psyched Image Region Props. Um, also one of the most popular plugins, let's say, uh, maintained by myself and Marcelo. And Marcelo programmed here this very nice tool because we often have this use case that people want to segment objects within other objects and then know for each cell there are multiple granules in there and we want to know their average size. 
So you can in this tool nicely configure how you want to group objects together. And um, if you do a summary statistics on them, you can configure what kind of summary statistics are made. So here you see now this checkbox. Of course, you can measure the average, but you can also count, for example, how many objects are there per object and these kind of things. So Marcelo spent some time in this uh, very, very user friendly interface. You should definitely try it out. If you want to do some feature extraction also in three dimensional images, I actually recommend um, Napari, so get, uh, Napari Simple ITK Image Processing. So, ITK is the Insight Toolkit. It's, uh, as far as I know, the oldest image processing library we have on Earth, so decades old, used in medical products. So, there's like medical software out there where patients are actually treated from. So, I would say that this Insight Toolkit, the ITK library, has a very high quality. Um, regarding software quality. So Simple ITK is built on top and Napari is Simple ITK Image Processing is a Napari plugin for making this available. Um, in particular for measurements in three dimensions, it may make a lot of sense measuring shape, for example, of objects in 3D. And there is another plugin, Napari Nuxus, which is rather new. I think it's something like three months old. Um, and when I discovered it, I was quite amazed because it has something like 400 features implemented. Uh, Well-known features from Psychic Image, ImageJ, um, Cell Profiler. And that's quite cool because I found myself multiple times re-implementing features or getting some measurements from this one library and some measurements from the other library. And I'm quite optimistic that Napari Nuxus or the underlying Nuxus library has all of them or many of them implemented so that makes my life easier if I want to measure if I want to just do some feature extraction on objects. Independent from which of these libraries you use for your features and um, you can then afterwards interact with these features with this result table you see here on the right. So you can um, double click on these elements. Therefore, you have to have this button activated and also the show selected checkbox down here. You can also with this button, you can also pick the object and then you will see to which measurement in the table this belongs. That's also a feature many image users were waiting for many years. In Napari, now we have it available. One more thing you can do with this table, you can also double click these table headers and you will then get a visualization of this particular measurement in three dimensions. So you can then see uh, which of these objects have a larger volume or which are more elongated than other objects. And that's in the visual fashion in three dimensions. I have shown you earlier in Apari Accelerated Pixel and Object Classification. So here in this case, I was annotating some region here in this tribulium embryo, which is called the embryo. And I was annotating some nuclei out there, which are called the serosa, the protecting hull around the embryo. And then I trained an object classifier for differentiating these two objects. And I see it then in these colors visualized. So that's like common tools you find in Apari classifying objects, segmenting objects, these kind of things. The Clusters Plotter, uh, developed um, by Laura Ryan, Marcelo and my group, and later Thorsten joined uh, Thorsten Wagner from the MPI Dortmund and was like bringing super cool additional stuff in there so that we can also better work with large electron microscopy data. Um, and this tool basically serves that you can plot the one measurement against the other, and then in this plot you can annotate some region and then figure out to which biological spatial region this belongs to in the plot. Um, so very commonly people do these kind of operations um, on UMAP. So you also find the UMAP algorithm and other um, dimension dimensionality reduction tools implemented in this Napari plugin, which was also very successful from my perspective. Um, the, term, the term for doing for this kind of um, techniques is unsupervised machine learning for exploring um, the parameter space, which has been measured from different objects. And there's also this thing which you should definitely, which we should definitely mention nowadays when we talk about um, machine learning or artificial intelligence. So Louis Croyer in the so-called uh, weekend project, um, he was programming um, Napari ChatGPT, which brings you a little agent called Omega. And you can see here in this uh, screenshot still, Louis asked, can you please generate a widget? segmenting nuclei or something like that. And it was producing the code for this because it was nicely instructed. And uh, Luik pressed on the run button and executed this tool. So uh, the, 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 all the Napari plugins we programmed uh, may become obsolete sooner or later because ChatGPT can do this job as well. ChatGPT can apparently program Napari plugins 
Uh, least the simple stuff like segmenting nuclei. Code for segmenting nuclei should be on the internet uh, multiple thousand times available. So this large language model has learned how to do this. Um, Luik here internally trained um, Napari ChatGPT that it can also handle Napari correctly and make plugins. Um, and this combination of that looks actually very interesting because we can now spare a lot of work. We do not have to write this boilerplate code anymore. We can use the artificial intelligence to program Napari plugins and make our life easier. Um, there's also these Napari plugins, which are not 100% serious. Uh, if you, for example, are interested in how to interact with the keyboard and how to have estate handling uh, Napari layers and how you can interactively program Napari plugins, uh, maybe you want to have a look at Natari, um, where you show, for example, how keyboard shortcuts work and how you can save the state of uh, moving around object and doing some simulations. Uh, and yeah, I cannot show all Napari plugins today because again, it's hundreds of them out there. And I would say the era of plugins has just begun. Um, let's see how what the exponential coefficient looks like. Um, but I'm afraid we will hit 1000 Napari plugins in a year and then it will become quite hard to find the right plugin for your particular purpose. And that's why um, the Napari Hub was set up by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, who is responsible for um, these kind of projects. Napari Hub is a website where you can uh, you can search for particular plugins. And here I would recommend you uh, entering the thing you want to do. So for example, if you want to do cell segmentation, enter that in the search field and you will find plugins which have cell or segmentation in their documentation. And that's also the opposite hint is if you are an Apari plugin developer, make sure that in your documentation you have biological terms used um, to explain what the thing is doing. Uh, only if you have cell segmentation in your cell segmentation plugin mentioned, people will find it. Um, so make sure that the documentation reflects what your plugin is doing. Also, another hint in this um, in the Napari Hub is um, you can on this um, detail pages. So, for example, here I was clicking on Napari Psychedelic Region Props on this plugin, again maintained by Marcelo and myself. Uh, so you can see a bit more details by clicking on this activity button, and you can, for example, see this plugin was released two years ago, and it was downloaded 40,000, 14,000 times. Um, the latest commit is something like two months ago. So it's not that actively like people are working on that very heavily. That can be a good sign in particular if the plugin is quite old, uh, but people are doing something. So there was like 200, 300 commits. So there was code was changed over the time. People were taking care of that. So I would argue, I, of course I'm biased because I'm author of this thing, but um, I would argue something that is two years old and is maybe updated every two or three months. That's a good sign. That's a high quality potentially high quality. If you find a plugin that was released two years ago and the latest commit was two years ago, it's possible that nobody is taking care of that. So I would look in this activity page um, and I would interpret these numbers carefully. And if you, for example, find five plugins which do the segmentation you are interested in and three of them are very new or like no no longer attached for two years then maybe you try the others out first um, just as a careful hint look a bit in this usage statistics in the maintenance statistics to get a bit an insight of what is happening with this plugin if it's like actively used and maintained by people but i also would like to introduce you to the napari assistant which is basically some kind of a mother plugin on top of other plugins but i will show you in detail so we were thinking of how can we make a user interface to all these different mathematical operations filters we have in Napari available. Uh, the idea was to make a user interface that is similar to a pocket calculator. So we want to have a pocket calculator for image data, the Napari assistant. Uh, again, you find on the left, you find the viewer controls and on the right, you find image analysis tools like um, the Napari assistant. So just as a recap. Uh, here you see the assistant in action. So it has these buttons. You can click on them and then you will see on the bottom that there are filters where you can change parameters. And then after you have changed, for example, the background subtraction, you can use a segmentation algorithm um, and you can also apply some measurements to these segmented objects. So Ryan um, was together and my group was working with me on that. So I have this very user friendly implemented. You see, for example, here in bright gray, potentially next steps you can apply after doing the thing you just did. 
A few wonder why these buttons are so big, because you can use this tool from a big touch screen. So that may make a lot of sense. In particular, if you like me interact with image data, like with your hands on a big touch screen, if you prefer that over typing code into a command line. Again, after segmenting, uh, after selecting one of these gray buttons on top, um, and then choose different algorithms here from this pull down. So I was clicking on remove noise. That's why you read also here remove noise. And then I have in this operation pull down, I have multiple algorithms available. You see, for example, also the Gaussian blur here is implemented multiple times in simple ITK, in scikit image, and in Clasperanto. So that is quite can be quite handy if you, for example, are working on a computer where simple IDK doesn't work or where the graphics card is not Clasperanto compatible, then you can go back to the scikit image Gaussian blur. So depending on what kind of computer you are working on, not all of them may work. Um, and that's why it might be useful to switch from the one implementation to the other implementation. Also to compare if they do the same. Yeah? Technically, theoretically, they should. Also here, after you click on the binarize button, um, you can then also see different threshold algorithms. That's the same idea. And you can also use different labeling algorithms after clicking on the label button. So it's like, that's how the user interface looks like. If you don't know in which category your algorithm, uh, the, the, the algorithm you want to use, in which category it might be, there's this search field. And also here, you can enter different stuff. So for example, if you know on this computer, scikit image works really well, you can enter scikit image into the search field and you will then only find the operations um, which are implemented in scikit image. And then you can use the remove noise and binarization algorithms from this library. What I also would recommend is writing biological terms in there. For example, I would like to do membrane based cell segmentation, enter membrane. And also here again, if you are a plugin developer, this only works if you document in the doc string of your function, if you tell the user that this function might be useful for membrane based cell segmentation. Furthermore, if you enter a term which is like unknown, um, so the assistant does not know any tool about that uh, for doing that, then you can search the Napari hub, you can search image.sc or you can search the bioimage informatics index. So that's 10 additional buttons which pop up in case you search something that is not found in the database. You can also have a look in the tools menu. You find pretty much all operations which are available in the assistant. You also find in the tools menu. The tools submenus are called a little bit differently because here we had more space than in the assistant, but I hope it's still uh, handy. Uh, tools menu also in general, there are more entries than in the assistant because there are tools which are not assistant compatible. But on the other hand, searching in these menus might also be not very user friendly. That's why again, we came up with the assistant. So for example, here here in the remove noise um, submenu, you find again, or for example, again, these three Gaussian blur implementations from these three libraries. And you also find other filters from other libraries. Um, then there's the background removal where you find these uh, rolling ball, subtract Gaussian background, these common algorithms we are used to. In the segmentation labeling menu, I've also shown you earlier, you find um, classical algorithms connected component labeling, um, but you also find machine learning based stuff like the object segmentation from APOC. The segmentation labeling menu um, also has some shortcuts implemented. So if you if you are used to applying a Gaussian blur and a threshold O2 to your data, you may want to apply Gauss O2 labeling, which does exactly that, plus a connected component labeling. So you don't have to call these three operations, Gaussian blur, threshold O2, connected component labeling. You can do this in one single step. So that's a shortcut we implemented because we are doing this so often. The same menu also contains this algorithm Voronoi O2 labeling, which is a bit more complicated, um, but allows you to do this um, segmentation of these, opt of these eight shade objects um, independently. So they are basically cut similar to what the watershed algorithm in ImageJ does. Speaking of which, I also made some effort at some point to implement uh, an algorithm which is as similar as I could make it to the ImageJ watershed algorithm. It's not 100% identical, but it's almost the same thing. So if you want to go from a binary image like that to another binary image like that, where these objects here are cut, 
Uh, so that's what the binary watershed in ImageJ does. You uh, can use this tool here. It's called Split Touching Objects in the Segmentation Post Processing Tools menu. Um, we called it differently because this watershed thing here in ImageJ is not very self explanatory, and some people actually complain that this is a misleading term. And that's why I chose this name here, which might be more uh, pointing at the actual functionality. You find a very similar algorithm in tool segmentation labeling. It's called label touching objects. Also, this is pretty much the same thing as above, but the difference is that the result is a label image and not again a binary image. But it's the algorithmically, these two are very close by each other. Yeah, there's also nice tools like, for example, expanding labels. And here you also see that you can change this parameter here down there. I will also show it in action in a minute. Um, so for tuning parameters of algorithms, you can do this there on the bottom. Here in this case, shown with processing labels, with dilating labels. Um, and there's different morphological operations we applied, for, we implemented for label image. So imagine um, this is your original label image, the cell segmentation, and you have some regions like this one here where you are not 100% sure if this is right. And you want to smooth the outlines a bit. There's, for example, an er a label erosion and a label dilation. These two together are called opening or can be seen as a morphological opening on label images. You also see now there is now a black region here in between. So we do not get back to the original. It's like some pixels remain black. Um, in order to avoid that, there is this moving labels operation which fills these gap. Otherwise, these two are pretty much identical. So you see here in this region where it was not so clear at the beginning, you can fine tune how the segmentation is supposed to look like. And if you choose a very wide radius, obviously you can completely screw up your segmentation. Uh, this is also available in Napari. You can here show your label image on top of your original image and really fine tune carefully how these how the radius of this particular operation should be applied. Just some word about um, this Napari Assistant compatible plugin. So I've shown it earlier. There are some algorithms which are multiple times implemented, like Second Image, Clasperanto, and uh, Simple ITK bring a Gaussian blur. And there's a reason for that. And it is basically visualized here on this plot. So I have um, on these two axes, I see device compatibility and processing performance. So if you look into uh, Scikit image, which is the library sitting behind Napari segment blobs and things with membranes. Scikit image runs on pretty much every computer out there. But some operations, in particular when you process 3D images, are quite slow. So a Russian blur takes some time. So I have observed that the simple ITK library is faster in many cases. So that's why it's more here on the app, but also it's a little bit to the left because it does not run on all computers. So sometimes there are issues with installation of this tool or with executing it later. Even more dramatic, let's say, uh, is the difference to these two libraries, QPy and Clasperanto. So that's GPU accelerated image processing in both cases. Also both come with an Apari plugin. And here they are obviously more on left because they are harder to get run on computers they do not run everywhere they are also much faster from a processing performance point of view so Clasperanto requires an OpenCL compatible GPU which is are produced by multiple vendors so there are many of them available and QPy needs an Nvidia GPU from one particular vendor so it's not as compatible as the others um, but also very fast and again if you want to process three-dimensional data, potentially over time, multiple time points of 3D stacks, you are somehow, you need GPU acceleration. Otherwise, um, other libraries are simply too slow and you can spare orders of magnitude processing time by using a GPU. So it's not as compatible as um, Psychic Image, but faster. Good. The cool thing after setting up an image processing workflow, like I've shown before, um, you can generate a Jupyter notebook from that using the Napari Assistant. So you see here, I'm now executing this code and you see on the left how a new Napari viewer is opening, showing the same segmentation result before. So I will show this in action in a minute, um, just as a video in advance. Again, to start Napari, you have to activate our Conda environment. So that's Conda activate. In my case, and in your case, the environment might be called differently. And this time we do not start Napari like Napari, but we start Naparia, which is the Napari Assistant. You can also start the Napari Assistant from a menu, but sometimes it's quite handy to do this directly from the command line. 
Yeah, and then Napari opens with the assistant already open. If you do, if you start Napari the normal way, you find assistant, the assistant also here in the utilities menu, and then the same window will pop up. Um, so let me just quickly demonstrate what I was telling. So I'm again opening um, an example image like this one. I'm removing some noise from this image, even though it might not be super noisy. I can tune here a bit the parameters. Um, then I would like to binarize the image, which is, for example, threshold O2 here is selected per default. And afterwards, I would like to label the image. So this labeling algorithm here in this particular case does not look very good. So I choose a different one. For example, I would like to use connected component labeling. And then this is the result. The cool thing about the assistant is now we can, for example, select here the Gaussian blur step I was doing at the beginning, and we can change these parameters and we will see um, how the segmentation is influenced by this Gaussian blur we did before the segmentation. So it's basically live updating the results. So I will just set that back. Um, so I have now my nice segmentation algorithm. I'm happy with this result. And that's why I will now here on click on generate code and I would like to export a Jupyter Notebook. So then a Jupyter Lab will open and I can click here on a kernel and then I should be able to execute this code and see my Gaussian blur, my threshold O2 and my connected component labeling result. So it's kind of, that's for, for reproducibility of science that might be quite useful. You set up a workflow in the assistant by clicking and then afterwards you generate a notebook and you have then the Python code which does these particular operations and you also know in which library the particular, in which version the particular library was used. So that might be quite um, user friendly for reproducible image analysis workflows with Python generated from Napari. So I have some exercises for you. Well, first of all, if you do not have any Conda environment or Napari installed on your computer, you may first want to go through this blog post from Maha Lampard where she explains how to install Mamba Forge on your computer. Mamba Forge is basically a tool for installing Python based libraries in so called Conda environments. And you can read a bit more in this blog post um, what these terms mean. So she guides you through the installation process in very detail. At some point on the bottom, you can execute JupyterLab and you can also execute Napari and see if the installation was successful. Uh, and I also would like to ask you to set up one particular Conda environment using this command. You can copy paste it here from the slide. Uh, please set up a Conda environment like that um, before starting Napari. You see also here Napari 4.18. That's the recent version which came out some weeks ago in order to make sure that everything is compatible with each other. Please execute this command. Um, feel free to change the environment name here. That's the one I was just using um, when I made this slide. Then um, you call Conda, activate, and here you again find the same environment name and run Napari. If you come up with a Napari, which looks completely different like that, like just half of the buttons are shown or something like that, please get in touch via image.se and we can have a look at your computer together. It is most likely related to troubleshooting graphic cards driver. So you can also click here on this link in advance and have a look. Otherwise, we can deal with this issue online on image.se to make sure the installation worked nicely on your computer. Um, and then a first task would be what I showed today at the very beginning. Um, do this pixel and object classification using Napari RPOC. Um, and you find you find two videos here where I'm doing that um, in this PowerPoint presentation, which you can download. Um, and you will also find detailed steps of how to do this um, behind these two links. So click on these links and you find a step-by-step -step guide of how to do this. Then the next step would be um, setting up an image processing workflow like I've also just shown using the Napari Assistant and generating a notebook from that. So that's also a nice exercise. Again, you find these two tutorials um, where you can click on and go through that in step by step fashion um, and learn how to do this. So I would like to thank uh, my team, which keeps my back free while I'm sitting in my kitchen giving lectures to my laptop. I also would like to thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative in particular, who is funding our efforts in writing blog posts and making YouTube videos. And I would like to thank you for your attention.